I'm David Schweinger. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Sociology. And on behalf of our department's seminar committee, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture, which is co-sponsored by the Departments of Sociology and Statistics, the LAS Miller Lecture Funds, and the Committee on Lectures, which is funded by the government, government of the student body. And I'd also like to thank uh, Brian Monahan, who's a member of our faculty who was a PhD student of Joel's and who, uh, who helped organize Joel's visit. Joel Best received his PhD in Sociology from the University of California, Berkeley in 1971 and subsequently received a master's degree in history from the University of Minnesota. He has worked at Concordia College, Cal State Fresno and Southern Illinois and is now a professor of sociology and criminal justice at the University of Delaware. Joel is one of the leading uh, sociological scholars of social problems. In particular, he has helped develop a social constructionist perspective on social problems that ask questions like, why are some social conditions defined as social problems, why others are not? And how do activists, journalists, experts, and government officials work to create and define social problems? The substantive topics of his research have included such problems as missing children, 19th century brothel prostitution, Satanism, road rage, stalking, kudzu, children's toys, and most famously, deadly Halloween candy. Joel has written several books, including Threatened Children, Controlling Vice, Random Violence, and Flavor of the Month, Why Smart People Fall for Fads. He has also edited several collections of social problems readings and written one of the leading social problems textbooks. Joel's book, Damn Lies in Statistics, which is also the title of tonight's talk, turns the tools used to understand social problems to numbers examining how statistical claims are created, used, and misused by activists, politicians, and media. And he followed this book with more damn lies in statistics and stat spotting. And I see they're all for sale at the uh, back of the room. Joel is a former president of the Midwest Sociological Society and of the Society for the Study of Social Problems and a former editor of the journal Social Problems. He is currently editor of Soci Sociology Compass. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Joel Best. All right, um, this is true. Uh, I don't know, 1996, I think, I had a graduate student show up in my office, and uh, uh, the graduate student gave me a paper and wanted me to read it, and the first sentence in the paper was, was this. It was a quotation, and it was properly a footnote in every, everything. Every year since 1950, the number of American children gunned down has doubled. And I thought to myself, you know, we are just getting a lower quality of graduate student than you know, we used to. Uh, they can't copy a simple quotation down correctly. And I thought that I would just go over to the library, look up the citation, get the correct quotation, and beat the graduate student over the head with it, because uh, this was obviously ridiculous. Um, and uh, so I went over to the library and, and looked up the uh, article. And there was the sentence, every year since 1950, the number of American children gunned down has doubled. Now, this is my nomination for the worst social statistic ever. Why is it so bad? Well, let's imagine that in 1950, <laughs> the number of American children gunned down was one. And if it doubles each year, it would have been two in 1951 and four in 1952. It would have been 1,000 by 1960, a million by 1970. And then the number starts to get really large. Um, <laughs> by the time that the uh, article was published, the number of American children being gunned down each year was 35 trillion. And of course, uh, it's something like one quintillion today, assuming that the, uh, uh, the trend has continued. Uh, I wrote the author of the article, and I said, you know, impressionable young people read this stuff. Uh, you know, where did you get this statistic? And he said, well, I got it from, and he was a little huffy about it, uh, I got it from the uh, Children's Defense Fund. The Children's Defense Fund, as some of you may know, is a prominent uh, organization that advocates for children. So I went to the library again, and I looked up the Children's Defense Fund, and I discovered that they, in fact, had said something slightly different. They said the number of American children killed each year by guns has doubled since 1950. In other words, it had doubled 
once, okay? Uh, the author, presumably trying to avoid plagiarism, had reworded the sentence and in the process created a new mutant statistic which meant something very different. And, you know, this is kind of my topic tonight. Uh, some of you have taken statistics classes. Let me tell you that if we had a statistics B in this room, I would be one of the very first to sit down, okay? Uh, I don't know a lot of statistics in the sense of uh, the kinds of things that you cover in those courses. But what I want to talk about today are numbers that turn up in sort of common places, in newspaper articles, uh, on the TV, in government documents, etc., etc., etc. And people use numbers all the time to make a point. When the author writes that the number of American children gun being gunned down is doubled, that's supposed to make us concerned. Now, actually, if you think about it, maybe we shouldn't be all that concerned because the population in the United States nearly doubled during that same period. You'd expect that a lot of things would have doubled. Uh, it's not clear that this is really a sign that uh, we are living in a much more violent society or anything. But I want to think a little bit about how numbers get used and what we ought to do when we encounter numbers of this sort. And I want to begin by asking the question, where do we get our fixation with numbers? And I think it's third grade social studies, okay? Third grade social studies, you had a unit called facts and opinions. And you learned that there are two kinds of statements. There are facts, and facts are really, really true. And then there are opinions which people may think are true, but aren't necessarily true. Not everyone would agree, okay? So if you say there are 50 states in the United States, that's a fact. If you say Citizen Kane is the greatest American movie, that's an opinion. And you learn in third grade social studies that when a sentence has a number in it, it's usually a fact, okay? That's one of the clues. And, and we tend to think that numbers are facts. We tend to think that somebody counted something, all right? That they're real, all right? In fact, we tend to think of them, if you will, it's kind of like rocks, okay? Statistics are out there in the world in the same way that rocks are in the world, and you can pick them up in the same way that a rock collector can pick up a stone or something like that. I want to suggest that that's really a bad way of thinking, and it's more helpful to think about statistics as jewels, okay? Now, a jewel, and, and, and this, by the way, this is what happens when you learn how to use Google Images. That thing on the left is a... Uh, uncut, or maybe only semi-cut, I'm not sure, ruby, okay? That's what a ruby looks like before it grows up to be a real ruby. And uh, on the right, of course, we have a real ruby. And what you realize is that the rock collector may recognize a sort of natural reddish stone which uh, could grow up to be a ruby, but turning a rock into a jewel is a social process. Somebody has to find the stone, somebody has to cut the stone, somebody has to polish the stone, they put it in a setting to be viewed from a particular angle, and so on and so forth. And that's what I want you to see tonight about numbers. Numbers don't exist in nature. Somebody had to count something, all right? There's a social process here, you know, if, if those of you that are taking sociology classes, we would say numbers are socially constructed. Right? Somebody has to go to the work of figuring out what to count, figuring out how to count it, figuring out how to you know, interpret what gets counted, and presenting it so that other folks can understand it and learn from it. Right? And it's important to keep your eye on that social process. Because a lot of numbers just sort of appear out of nowhere. Okay? It's a number that I like a lot. I'm, I'm, you know, I may be the only one that really likes this number, but you can hear it a lot. Each year in the United States, one billion birds die colliding with windows, okay? Now, this has a couple of qualities that I particularly find interesting. The first is a billion is a lot, okay? It's really a lot. You know, we, we, we sometimes get into this thing, a million, a billion, what's the difference? Actually... You know, it's a big difference, okay? And so, uh, you know, 
that's a, that's a reason to get to give pause. A second thing that you might ask yourself is, how would somebody count that? Okay, how could somebody know that there are a billion birds? Okay, and a third clue, which ought to capture our attention right away, is that this is a suspiciously round number. We are often told that social problems come in very even units. There are a million cases of elder abuse each year, there are two million missing children, there are three million homeless, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a billion is about the roundest number you can imagine. Now, where does this number come from? Well, in the old days, the initial estimate was that there were about three and a half million bird deaths from window collisions. Three and a half million, a lot less than a billion a whole lot less. How did they come upon that number? They came upon that number by saying in the continental United States there are roughly 3.5 million square miles, figure one bird death per square mile, that's how many birds die. Okay? And there's an ornithologist who said, no, that's, that's not any way to study this. So he did some research. Now this is really true. Okay? He took two houses Okay, one was in southern Illinois. I used to live, the, the people that he picked for his research were actually neighbors of mine. They were an elderly couple who had custom built a house because they loved birds. They had picture windows all around the house. They had bird feeders. They had bird baths. Their house was a bird magnet. And this guy came to them and said, would you be willing to count dead birds at your house? You know, because they, they did know that sometimes birds flew into their window and they were terribly distressed when this happened, and would you be able to count this? And they said, sure. And the other house was a house in New York. I don't know if those people were, were bird, bird fanciers or not. In any case, he did this study, and then he, he came up with some numbers, and actually there were quite a few birds that, that died this way. I've forgotten. I think there were about... I don't know, 20 birds or something that were, were dying each year at my neighbor's house. We had screens on our, all our windows. I lived there in that house eight years. We never had a bird fly into a window. So, I mean, you know, what are we supposed to conclude? Uh, in any case, he then decided that there was, you know, since his two-house sample might not be representative, uh, he thought that perhaps he ought to do something else. So he, he did the following calculation. He looked it up. The federal government has some estimate for how many buildings there are in the United States. It's just under 100 million. Okay. He said, let's figure there are between 1 and 10 bird deaths per building. Okay. Uh, therefore, you get somewhere between about 100 million and a billion. And, you know, that, that's a big range. You know, he was, you know, he, he, was, he was pretty open about this. When the press would pick this up, they would throw out the hundred million to a billion and they would just fix on the billion figure and that is the extremely accurate uh, research that uh, produced that estimate that we have so much confidence in. Not everybody agrees. Uh, there's a bird death website, there are several by the way, um, that says there are 80 million birds killed by window collisions, but they say domestic cats, mind you, not feral cats, kill a billion birds a year. And I thought that was interesting. I looked it up. Uh, there are about, according to the federal government, 71 million pet cats, including the cats that used to live at my house and were indoor cats, and they would have to average 14 bird deaths per year in order to <laughs> polish off a billion years. Could be. I don't know. Okay. Now, the point is that here's a number that's floating around. You can find this number in, in, in magazine articles. You can find this number in major newspapers. You can find it, like I had the quote from NPR, and so on and so forth. Lots and lots of people repeat this number. And, you know, the interesting question is, where did it come from? All right? And when you hear a number like that, a great big number, a great big round number, where you have to ask, how would they count that? It's time to start asking questions. It's time to think a little critically about what's going on. I have no idea what my next slide is. This is going to be exciting. Oh, yes, okay. This is Adam Walsh. Uh, you, many of you are probably too young to remember Adam Walsh. Adam Walsh was the child of John Walsh of America's Most Wanted. Uh, and he is going to represent for us how you build a social problem in the United States. Basically, there is a three-part recipe to having a social problem. 
And the first part of the recipe is you find an awful example. Now, the story of Adam Walsh is perhaps the worst story in the history of the world. He was a little six-year-old boy. He went to the shopping mall with his mother. His mother was looking at lamps. He got bored, asked if he could go wander over. This is in Sears. Can I wander over here 30 feet to look at the toys? Sure, Adam. His parents never saw him again alive. They later recovered his head, okay? I mean, this is an awful story, okay? And that's the first thing you do. If you, if you watch it, news stories about social problems, they often start by telling you a really awful story, a compelling story. Homeless family of four living in a car, you know, whatever it is. The second thing that you do is you name the problem. And Adam Walsh was, was a particularly important because this is a gripping story. People were horrified by this story. And he became the most visible figure in the missing child movement. Now, the missing child movement, what is, and, and, and you read a news story. Here's the awful story of Adam Walsh, and then there would be a sentence, Adam Walsh is a missing child, okay? Wow, okay. Now, in fact, missing child turned out to mean, mean a lot of other things. Uh, it turned out to mean 14-year-old girls who get mad at their parents and go to their best friend's house overnight uh, it turned out to mean children who are uh, caught up in custody disputes and get uh, uh, taken in violation of the custody order by one of the parents, uh, you know, all kinds of things like that. But what happened was that the people who were involved in the missing children movement said, you know, it's very important that we not minimize, we not dismiss any missing child. Every missing child is important, okay? So Adam Walsh becomes the example, missing child becomes the label, and you'll see John Walsh, who got, uh, you know, became a very prominent leader in the missing children movement, uh, you know, was going around saying uh, fairly inflammatory things. Third part of the recipe, you need a number. And the number that was routinely made in the early 1980s was each year two million children go missing. Now, you hear the story of Adam Walsh, and you hear that number, and you think, you know, I sort of envision a mountain of two million little heads someplace. I mean, it's, it's, it's that kind of thing. Adam Walsh is the typical missing child. Good grief. Well, this country has a problem. Now, in those days, there were roughly 60 million kids between, you know, inf infancy and age 18, all right? So think about that for a moment. For there to be two million, this, uh, this is a statistic that was everywhere. It was on the network news. It was, it, it was in major magazines. It was in major newspapers. Politicians quoted this statistic over and over again. Now, that's one child in 30. That would mean that all across America, every second grade classroom, every third grade classroom, every fourth grade classroom would have a missing child every year. It's a lot of kids, okay? I mean, right away, you gotta think to yourself, there's probably something wrong with that. And you know, not only that, but people, people knew that most missing children were runaways, but they said there are 50,000 Adam Walsh's every year, okay? It's a lot of Adam Walsh's. The government later tried to, to count them and concluded there were about 300, okay? So the number that you get is, a, is often a little large. And when you're trying to make a social problem, the people who are trying to build social problems are sincere people, okay? They believe that missing children is a serious social problem. They believe that something ought to be done about it. And, you know, they hear a number. Somebody says, well, maybe there are two million of them. And they think, well, it's a big problem, that's a big number, it sounds about right, okay? Nobody's thinking about it very much, and once it's in circulation, it's very easy to repeat, okay? Uh, why is this here? Uh, this is a reminder. All our numbers come from someplace, okay? Uh, there are people going out collecting. You know, the census is, a, is an obvious example. People knocking on doors, interviewing folks, calling them up on the telephone, okay, doing different kinds of data collection. All numbers are rooted in some sort of social process. And a number like 
two million missing children is probably a guess, okay? It, you know, and probably the first time somebody uttered that, mo that number, they didn't say, oh, we did scientific research, we did a national poll or something like that. They probably said, you know, this is our best guess. It's a ballpark estimate. It's a guesstimate, you know, whatever you want to call it. Right? But once the number is out there, a bad number is harder to kill than a vampire. People, you know, keep it alive. They repeat it, and they repeat it because it's a fact, okay? It's a number. It's a fact. Somebody must have counted something, they tell themselves. Okay? Now, we can get bad numbers of all sorts. Some of them are pretty obvious. This is from uh, two summers ago? Last Harry Potter book? Two summers ago, right? Yeah. Okay. I'll just let you read that for a moment. That went out over AP, you know? This is the phenomenon of the slippery decimal point. Uh, you would think that maybe the reporter would have gotten that right. You would think that maybe the editors that were editing this would have gotten it right. Maybe the editors at the newspaper that reprinted the story would have gotten it right. I mean, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of eyeballs that looked at this and passed on this. I saw this in my local paper, and, and it turns out it was, it was printed else, elsewhere. So there are some numbers that are just wrong, okay? Here's, here's one. This is a website. Uh, You've got to read the, the, the top part up here. Each year, four million women are battered to death by their husbands or boyfriends. Wow. That's a lot. It's particularly a lot if you look at the FBI data down below, which gives you the total number of homicides in 2007. <laughs> uh, a little under 15,000, okay? What are the odds that 4 million of those 15,000 are, <laughs> right? Okay. You see the problem, all right? Um, we get bad information. This is one of my graduate students gave a presentation and used this slide. This is possibly the worst graph in the history of the universe, okay? Just, just look at this for a little bit and try and figure out what that means, okay? I mean, there's a basic principle in graphing, which is somehow the space in the graph is related in some way to some numbers, okay? And, you know, that's such a marvel. I, I just, you know, I don't even have anything smart to say about this. Uh, it's just, you know, such a fabulous graph. I thought I ought to show it. Here's a graph. This is, this is much better. This is from the, um, the, the American Sociological Association. It's, it's from a journal that they print. And it's actually two graphs. This is graph one. And this is percentage of sexually active high school females. Wow. And here's going to be percentage of sexually active high school males. And it's actually divided by Hispanic, non-Hispanic whites, and blacks in both graphs. And then you get two years here. This is like 1991 and 1997, OK? And what I want you to see is that it certainly looks, when you compare the two graphs, like girls are having a lot more fun, OK? <laughs> Uh, which really isn't how I remember high school so much. <laughs> and, you know, you gotta, you got to kind of wonder about this. And then you look at this, and you can see that there's a problem. This graph is, is tall. This graph is squat, okay? This graph goes from 0 to 80. This graph goes from 0 to 100, okay? If you compare the bars, like this is 66%, this is 44%, but the 44% looks a lot bigger. Now, each of these graphs is perfectly okay, but printing them on the same page causes real problems. And in fact, there was some more stuff down here, and I think that what probably happened was they originally laid out the page with the two graphs, and then they realized they had to put words someplace, and somebody thought, you know, we'll just squish that one up, and it won't make any difference. But of course, what it does is it, it creates a completely erroneous impression. Uh, if you make those comparisons, the girls are, as you might imagine, less sexually active than the boys, but the graph conveys exactly the opposite impression. This, it, this used to be the worst graph in the history of the Western world, uh, and it's, it's an awfully good one. Uh, this comes from a book, okay? I mean, you, 
Do you have any idea how many people look at the page of a book with an editorial eye before it gets published? You know, the number of people who would look at something like this. Now, just look at this. This is actually a little complicated. You've got to understand this. This is a study of Danish women, all right? And the question is, what percentage of women get pregnant within six months after stop, stopping the use of contraception, okay? And they divide the women into two groups. There are those that drink fewer than five drinks a week and those that drink more than 10 drinks a week. And they find, I'm not sure you, everybody can read this, the group that drinks fewer than five drinks a week, 64% of them get pregnant within, within uh, six months. And only 55% of the group that drinks more get pregnant within five months. So they, you know, what we're comparing here is 64% versus 55%, all right? And you know, if a first question you might ask is, is that much of a difference? It doesn't sound like much of a difference to me, but maybe it is. I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a difference, I guess. But notice there's something puzzling. Okay, the, the big number, 64%, is represented by the five glasses, and the little number, 55%, is represented by the 10 glasses. And you realize this is a mistake that I've only seen in junior high school science projects, okay? This is graphing the independent variable, okay? Which if you, you know, it's not even, I'm not sure we even have this as a principle when we talk about drawing graphs. We sort of assume that people are going to understand this. But this is a graph that shows you that five drinks is fewer than 10 drinks, okay? <laughs> which, which, you know, might be useful information if, you know, you're having the 10 drinks or something. Maybe that's the, the thing that's, that's going on. But, you know, again, from a book, okay? Here's Newsweek, all right? This is another study. Uh, this, is, this is a study of HIV positive and HIV negative uh, gay men in New York City, okay? Uh, what percentage of them have used crystal meth? And what we see here is the HIV group has used crystal meth about 38% of the time, and the HIV negative group has used it about 18% of the time. So the HIV positive group uses crystal meth twice as much as the HIV negative group, okay? And so here we got this blob, which is presumably a meth crystal, and it's twice as big as, a, well, it uh, seems bigger than that. This is terrible. This is actually, there are, there are books on bad graphing practices, and this is usually the principle illustrated on page three, okay? This is the idea that if you make something twice as wide and twice as high, it is not twice as big, it is four times as big. <laughs> and this is complicated, this is made worse by the fact that the idiots that did this used a font that was twice as big as well, and actually dragged this number out three digits in a decimal point so that it conveys this sense. It doesn't convey the sense that this is twice as common. It conveys the sense that this is a whole big bunch more common, all right? And, you know, what I'm trying to suggest is there are bad numbers out there that you are going to run into all the time. You can't just pick up something and look at it and assume it's going to be okay. Um, Here's something a little bit more subtle. This is an article, this appeared in a major biology journal, okay? TB cases in the United States increased 18% from 1985 to 1991. Holy cow! What is going on? I thought we dealt with tuberculosis. What is going on? This is an article published in 1998, okay? Here's a graph that puts this into some kind of perspective. <laughs> Here's TB cases since, since uh, uh, 1940, okay? As you see, it has in fact fallen like a rock. And the years that uh, the article chose to talk about was this, <laughs> right here. Now, notice the article is actually published over here. They knew damn well that TB was not rising when they published that article. And 
what they're doing is they, they want to make a point, uh, and they, they, they want to convey the sense that the world's going to hell in a handbasket, basically, and the way that you make this point is you sort of pick data selectively to show what's out there. Uh, oh, this is, this is something that I like. This is kind of new. Uh, it's, it's sort of trendy. This is, this is uh, I got this by, by Googling lost productivity. Uh, and you'll see these things all the time. Uh, smoking costs the American economy 167 billion, these are in billions, 167 billion dollars a year, okay? And why would it cost 167 billion dollars a year? Well, smokers are, you know, first of all, are wasting time at work lighting up, I suppose, and, and beyond that, why they have more health problems, they're uh, more likely to miss uh, work for sick days, and, you know, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Now, clearly, smoking costs the American economy something. Okay? How do we know what it costs the American economy? Well, notice what you're going to do. You know, you're going to say, well, how many smokers are there? Okay? And then uh, how much is their time worth? And then how much time are they going to lose? Okay? And depending upon what value you choose for each of those three numbers, well, you know, that's going to determine what your outcome is going to be. Here's March Madness. March Madness costs $4 billion a year, okay? How could we possibly know this, okay? I mean, you know, how many people are spending how much time at work on March Madness? You know, we have no way of knowing this. But, you know, notice that you get these numbers and they're out there. If you add these up, by the way, they, th these numbers alone come to more than a trillion dollars, uh, which is, just to keep this in some kind of perspective, the American economy is a little over $10 trillion. It's like $13 trillion or something. And this is the first hundred hits in Google. Uh, this isn't like everything. I mean, if you, if, you, if you go look, why you can find lots and lots of other things. Hidden grief, okay? <laughs> How do we measure and calculate the value of hidden grief? <laughs> All right. Here's, this is a great, great example. This is, this is a little complicated. You've got to work with me here. This is an excellent lesson for students who have to write term papers. Okay? 1985, the newsletter for the American Anorexia Bulimia Association, which, as you might imagine, is an organization that is concerned with eating disorders, published an interview with Karen Carpenter. Karen Carpenter was a pop singer who had been anorexic and who died at an early age. And he said, in the course of this interview, this is a very serious illness. It affects between 150,000 and 200,000 Americans. At any given time, there are 150,000 anorexics, and this could kill you, okay, as it did Karen Carpenter. Okay, now, here we go. Three years later, we have a, a historian. Oh, I don't think my lightsaber is working anymore. Uh, the second quote is a historian who is writing a history of anorexia, and she footnotes that interview with the psychiatrist. Okay, this is her source, and she says, the American Anorexia and Bulimia Association says, that anorexia strike a million Americans every year and that 150,000 die annually. Now, do you see what happened, okay? We went from 150,000 people are sick with anorexia to they're dead, okay? <laughs> right, this, so, you know, and this is published by, you know, by Harvard University Press, which is a fairly snarky uh, uh, publisher, okay? Two years later, Naomi Wolf, a prominent feminist, writes, each year there are 150,000 women dying of anorexia, and she cites our historian, okay? A year after that, Gloria Steinem, an even more prominent feminist, writes about 150,000 females die of anorexia each year, and they're often the female version of the best and brightest. In other words, actually better than people uh, who don't die. And, and, and <laughs> And she is citing 
Naomi Wolf. Okay, now, now the lesson I'm trying to give you here, guys, is, you know, why do we make you footnote things? We make you footnote things because it's actually really interesting where you get your information. And this is an example of, you know, someone footnoting someone who footnoted someone who completely erroneously footnoted somebody else, okay? And, and once this bad number gets in to circulation, you can't stop it. Uh, here's Christina Hoff Summers, who's a conservative intellectual. She writes a really cranky book, and uh, she leads off with the anorexia example, and she says the correct figure is about 100 deaths per year. Now, you will hear people say she has lowballed this, and it's actually 1,000, but it ain't 150,000. We're quite sure, and I'll tell you why we're quite sure in a minute. Homework assignment for you tonight, go back home, Google 150 thousand and anorexia and I promise you you will find people repeating this statistic. Once a statistic is out there it will be repeated. Now this is a dumb statistic. Okay it's a really dumb statistic and let me try and explain why. Okay. What do we know about anorexics? Am I likely to be anorexic? Okay, without making comments about my weight. Why am I not likely to be, comment, be anorexic? I'm male and old, that's right. And we know that anorexics are mostly young and female. So how many young females die each year? Oh, I don't know, but I'll bet it's a lot. Okay. Well, let's agree, just for purposes of argument, that young females are between the ages of 15 and 44. Okay. Now, that's... Some of you may find that a little odd. You won't later. Uh, it'll, you know, you'll, you'll come around. But, 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 you know, 15 to 44, we, we, that's certainly a generous estimate, uh, you know, for the young female population. And, but, you know, you have to realize, too, Karen Carpenter wasn't 17 when she died. I mean, you know, oftentimes it takes a while for the health effects of anorexia to, to uh, uh, cause your early death. So it's not completely unfair. Okay. How many women each year die between the ages of 15 and 44? Now, I'm talking about auto accidents, all other accidents, homicide, suicide, all diseases. Okay, how many die each year? 55,000. Okay, all right. What are the odds that 150,000 of those 55,000 were anorexic? Okay. You know, I mean, if anybody had paused for a moment and given this a minute's thought, they would have known that ain't right. Okay. You know, we don't necessarily know what is right, but it sure ain't 150,000 people dying each year. It's clearly wrong. And we see this kind of thing. You can, you can find lots of examples of numbers repeating themselves this way. Okay, I'm going to, let me, let me do, I'm a, uh, oh, gee. Will you let me do three more? Okay, all right. These are all kind of long. I'll, I'll, I, won't, I won't do anything but three, but, but they're, they're all kind of long. Here we have the Journal of the American Medical Association. Every Wednesday it comes out. The day before it comes out, or a couple days before it comes out, they send out a press release, okay? And every Wednesday, if you look at your newspaper, there'll be an article that tells you something. Here are three articles doing kind of sociology stuff. And I want to look at the first one. 30% of, this is a study of kids in 6th through 10th grade, 30% of kids in 6th through 10th grade reported some type of involvement in moderate or frequent bullying, okay? What is bullying? Well, you know, I don't mean to keep reading this. I hate it when people read PowerPoint slides to me, but the, I want to read the second quote. Let's, let's look at this carefully for a moment. Bullying can take three forms, physical, hitting, kicking, spitting, pushing, taking personal belongings, verbal, taunting, malicious teasing, name calling, making threats, and psychological, spreading rumors, manipulating social relationships, or engaging in social exclusion, extortion, or intimidation. This is a study of people in sixth through 10th grade. Does anybody remember junior high school? Okay. What else do they do, <laughs> you know, during those years? I mean, you know, that, 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 that's the first question. But remember what the quote said. Let's go back and take a look at it for a moment. 
Some type of involvement in moderate or frequent bullying. What does that mean? Well, you know, they, what they did was they asked kids four questions. Question one, have you been bullied? Okay. And question two, if you have been bullied, how often does this happen? Okay. And it was like every week, you know, uh, I think it was every month, sometimes once a semester, you know, some, something like that, maybe every day. I've forgotten. But there were some choices. Okay. Question three, have you ever bullied anybody? Question four, how often have you done it? You know, every day, once a week, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Now, this creates, if you think about it, a pie of data. You, you, get, you get people who answer these questions, and you could carve up this pie in different ways. All right. And that's, that's what I want to point out. They, the researchers said that frequent was once a week or more often. Okay, which probably if you're being bullied seems pretty frequent. Moderate was sometimes. Okay. Okay, whatever that is. All right. So everybody said they'd been bullied or were bullying sometimes counted. Okay. Mo you remember what it said, moderate or frequent involvement in. Involvement in. Well, you know, there were four kinds of kids. There were kids that bullied people, kids that got bullied, kids that reported that they were both bullies and bullying victims, and kids that said they had nothing to do with bullying either way, okay? They counted the first three groups. If you said you had ever bullied, or if you said you had ever been victimized by bullying, that's involvement in. Involvement means both the victims and the bullies, all right? Now, let's say we cut the pie differently. Suppose we say we're just going to look at kids who say they are bullied at least once a week, frequently. Okay? How many are there? 8%. Okay? How many is it if we say moderate or frequent involvement, involvement in bullying? 30%. Okay? This, is a, this is an article that they're going to send out a press release on. And I read this article on the front page of the Wilmington News Journal, which is my local newspaper. Would the Wilmington News Journal have published that article if it said 8% of kids are frequently bullied? No. That sounds about right, you know. Sounds about normal, okay. 30% is much more troubling, okay. And you can see how this works. The authors, and the authors, by the way, put that 8% figure in there. I didn't recalculate this or anything. If you look in the article, you can find the 8% figure. But the authors wrote the article with the 30% figure in the abstract. The editors sent out the press release with the 30% figure in the abstract. And the reporter that read the press release thought this is a good story and wrote a story with the 30% figure. And editors in newspapers all across the country thought this is a good story and ran it. Okay, this is not something, you know, it's not that anybody's lying, right? But on the other hand, what are they doing? Okay, here's, here's another, here's, here's example two. That was one. Okay, here's two. There are only three. Okay, two. Um, this is, uh, uh, in the 1990s, the Centers for Disease Control got excited because there had been a substantial increase in suicide by black teenagers. And these are actually the real data, okay? When you die, your death certificate ultimately winds up at the National Center for Health Statistics, and they publish a big report each year which will tell you how many people of different ages, different races, different sexes, different regions in the country die of different causes. And, and this, is, this, is, this is actually, this is not a rate, uh, and, and it's not going to be a rate because I want to show you something in a minute. But if you, if you did the if you did rates, you would have the graph have the same shape. I've, I've calculated it with rates. It, it looks the same, okay? But this is the, th this is the increase. And it's, it's, it, it looks pretty impressive. And, you know, this got published by the Centers for Disease Control. It got picked up by reporters. Reporters start running around and interviewing uh, experts, you know, who are mostly the people who own suicide are, are usually psychiatrists. So, you know, what do people say? Somebody says it's post-traumatic slavery syndrome. 
okay? Now, I'm not sure why post-traumatic slavery syndrome is getting worse the further we're getting from slavery, but, you know, whatever. Here's somebody who says, black families have left largely minority communities, left lost traditional supports like the black church and so on and so forth. And the Centers for Disease Control actually said, and I'm sorry, I'm reading this slide, black youths and upwardly mobile families may adopt the coping behaviors associated with their new environments. In other words, they see the white kids committing suicide, so they want to do it too, okay? All right. I'm going to try and give you a different explanation. How can we explain this? All right. Well, here's the same graph that I just showed you, but there's another graph. This is another category that's presented by the National Center for Health Statistics, and that is undetermined deaths. This is sort of, the, they have like 300 plus categories of death, and at the end is undetermined, which means we punted. You know, we don't know what, what caused this. And what you can see is, Really, a kind of beautiful pattern. This one goes down to practically nothing. This one goes up. Huh. All right. Here's something else. Here are four popular causes of accidental deaths. Drowning, okay. Shooting is the green. The maroon is poisoning, and the, uh, the dark one is falls. Now, I picked this because this is also four popular ways to kill yourself. You swim out too far and drown. You uh, shoot yourself, you take some pills, or you jump off a high place, okay? And whenever a coroner encounters somebody with one of these causes of death, the coroner has to make a judgment. Was this self-inflicted or was it accidental? And what you can see is there's been a rather remarkable drop. This is all data for black teens. Uh, a rather remarkable drop for all four of these causes of death. And that leads me to my final graph, which is a thing of considerable beauty in my view, which is a combination of all of this information. The purple down here are black teen suicides, and they go up. Okay, we've seen that pattern. The red is the undetermined deaths. And the beige are all of those accidental deaths which might have been classified as suicides. Okay. And what you can see is the total number of deaths has gone from about 1,200 to 600, okay? But the proportion of the deaths that are labeled suicide has increased markedly, all right? What's going on? Well, interesting thing, if you look at something like California, a state like California, these levels are all pretty, pretty flat. You don't get the big, uh, the, the, the big slopes that I've been showing you. Where are you find? the slopes is in the south, all right? And the south is important for a couple of reasons. 1970, remember, is right after the Civil Rights Movement, okay? Uh, you still have a lot of unhappy uh, folks uh, in the south who are resenting uh, the Civil Rights Campaign. Uh, the coroners in the south are all going to be white. And in the south, in, Cal in a state like California, coroners have had to be physicians for a long time, for decades. In the South, coroner has often been an elective position, and it's often held not by a doctor, but by an undertaker. Uh, there are cases of it being held by barbers, okay, uh, all kinds of folks. So, you know, uh, standards for coroners have improved in, in, in over the years. And, you know, I would suggest to you that maybe what has gone on here is not so much that there's been a sudden wave of suicidal behavior by African-American teenagers, what may have gone on is the way people classify deaths, and in particular, the care that they took in classifying deaths. Nobody, now, you have like less than 10 undetermined deaths by black teens a year these days. It used to be more like 150, and they were mostly in the South. And people may have said, you know, we're not going to bother investigating this. It may be that what's happening is you're getting better coroner work and that that's really the source of, of the, uh, the thing. Now, can I prove that's true? No. Uh, it strikes me as at least as plausible as arguing that it is, uh, you know, uh, trying to, you know, imitation of, of, the, of the white kid's behavior or something like that, but maybe, it's, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, last thing. Anybody? Anyone? The Million Man March, okay? It's the Million Man March, and, and uh, this is, this is the, the U.S. Capitol building, and uh, 
here are the, I think the speakers are here. And this stuff that looks kind of like shag carpeting, that's lots and lots of people, okay? And, and it goes up and down. Now, the Million Man March was interesting. It was called by Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan is a fairly controversial figure in American politics. And he announced that he was going to have a demonstration where he was going to call a million African-American men to Washington to demonstrate on the National Mall. And, um, you know, this immediately uh, uh, created great consternation. Farrakhan's enemies, and he has a lot of them, uh, began to say he'll never do it. He won't get a million people there. And, you know, Farrakhan's uh, support staff immediately said, oh, yes, we will, oh, yes, we will, okay? And you can see, you can see the problem here. Million Man March. It's got that alliteration thing going for it. It sounds good, but it does sort of set a standard for success, okay? And, and the debate was, could, could they, would they get a million people? So the day of the march, you get a big crowd. This is a lot of people. And, and uh, uh, the march organizers come up to the podium and they say, Oh, here, I'll show you the picture of the crowd. There it is. There, there, there they are. There's a lot of people. And, they s and, you know, you're looking out. I mean, this is a lot of people, uh, you know, unquestionably. And, you know, they don't, they're not selling tickets. They don't have turnstiles. They're not counting noses. The march organizers said, hey, everybody, we did it. We have between a million and a half and two million people here. And the crowd goes, what? Okay. Now, what you need to understand is the National Mall is where there have been lots of demonstrations over the years. And... I, you know, in, in particular, when Vietnam came along, there would be anti-war demonstrations on the National Mall. And the reporters would go to the, the march organizers and say, how many people do you have here? And the march organizers would say, we, we have a million. And um, they'd ask the police, and the police would say 6,000. You know, and, and, and th th this, was, this was back at a period where the police were not in sympathy with the anti-war movement. You know, and it, there was a lot of tension. And there was all of this bickering. There would be pro-life and pro-choice movements and anti-war movements and pro-gun movements and anti-gun movements and everything. And they would come to the mall and they would, and you would get this conflict where the march organizers would always say, we got a big crowd and the, uh, and, and the police would often say it's not that big. So uh, Congress got sick of this and they charged the National Park Service Park Police, which is the law enforcement agency that controls the National Mall, and they said, we want you to count crowds. We want you to produce an official estimate of how big these crowds are. So what they did was actually very clever. They know how big the mall is, okay? Uh, and they would take aerial photographs like this one, and then they would calculate how many square feet were covered by people. And then they would do a formula and they'd say, how much space does each, how many square feet do we allot for each person? And they, they allotted 3.6 square feet, all right? Which is actually, I, I, I use, yeah, I'm not very good at this. I used to bring this, I used to bring a visual aid to this. Think of your, your daily newspaper, not your campus newspaper, but a regular, you know, big newspaper, and unfold it so that you've got two sheets, okay? That is almost exactly 3.6 square feet. So if you imagine the National Mall laid out in sheets of newspaper and there's one person standing on each sheet of newspaper, that would be how, cr how crowded they were. That was, the, that was the basis they were using for crowds. And so a couple days after the Million Man March, the National Park Service Park Police announced that the march drew 400,000 people. All right? And this created a great crisis. Farrakhan's uh, group said that this was racist and that, in fact, there had been a million people there and everybody knew there had been a million people there and, and so on and so forth. And, and there's a big tussle. And then there's a group. Oh, see, I've got this on bad order. Um, there, there's a group at Boston University which announces that they have calculated that there were 837,000 people plus or minus 25%. Now, that's really... <laughs> That's really good because if it's plus 25%, that'll be more than a million, okay? Now, how did they get that figure? Well, they got the aerial photographs from the National Park Service Park Police. It was the same photographs, but they calculated that each person took up 1.8 square feet. Now, 
you have been in a situation where this, you're in 1.8 square feet. It, you are in an elevator, you're not actually touching anybody else, and somebody else comes up and looks in and says, I'll wait, okay? That's 1.8 square feet. And so you gotta ask yourself, you know, the march went on for a long time. Did people stand that close to one another for the five or six hours that this demonstration occurred, okay? Now, the important thing to understand is, you know, if they'd called it the really big march, it wouldn't have been a problem, right? Because <laughs> it, was, it was a really big crowd. 400,000 was the biggest civil rights demonstration ever. It was bigger than the March on Washington in 1963, where Dr. King gave the I Have a Dream speech, which was probably in the neighborhood of a quarter million people. Uh, so this was a very successful demonstration, but because it wasn't a million, people got into an argument. And, and, and you get this argument about is it racist or isn't it racist or so on and so forth. Really, the question is, how close do you think people stood? Okay, and, and you know, you can obviously, if you change the formula, you can produce this crowd any size you want by just, just changing the, the, the numbers. And, uh, you know, I only found one newspaper article where this was explained. Everybody else was sitting around talking about racism and, and so on and so forth. Let me show you something else that's important. Um, these are from uh, uh, one of Dave's professors, Clark McPhail. This is what the crowd looks like if you're a Million Man March organizer. Okay, it looks like people are really packed together. It looks pretty crowded. Here's the same group of people if you look at it from above. It's not so crowded, okay? And part of what's going on is this. Here is the Obama inauguration. Wow, that's big, okay? That's way big. Here it is from the back. Look at that picture, wow. Just imagine how big that is. Okay, now here's the aerial shot, and what I want you to see, this is really very interesting. Here's the inauguration down here. Here's all the people, and these are the, this is where the people were for that Million Man March picture, too. That's, that's kind of the area that we had on the other slide. Here's a, here's a bunch of people. Here's a bunch of people. Here's a little bunch. Here's a bunch. Here's a bunch. Here's a bunch. Way down here, this is where that photographer was taking that picture going all the way up. Why is it like that? Anybody know? Yeah, yeah, these are where the jumbotrons are, okay? These people couldn't see a thing. You know, I mean, oh, look at this. You know, they are not watching the inauguration, okay? I, I mean, they're there, they're happy, they're excited, but, you know, there are big TV screens. And so what happened was, oh, that, that, that didn't work. What happened was they, they put out, you know, jumbotron screens up and down the mall, and people clustered there, and that's what's going on. How big was this crowd? Best guess, 1.6 million, okay? And, 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 and I would say, by the way, if you look at that, it's quite clear it's a lot more people than there were at the Million Man March, uh, a whole lot more. Uh, but, you know, the, the people that really tried to analyze this say maybe 1.6 million. Okay, so that was three examples. I'm gonna quit. Let me, let me, just, let me just, you know, do a wrap up, okay? The point of the sermon is that you are going to encounter nor, uh, numbers all the time. It's, they're going to be in every newspaper that you read every day. They're going to be in textbooks that you read. They're going to be in magazine articles. They are certainly going to be traveling around on the web. Uh, they're out there in all kinds of places. And my point is not that we shouldn't believe in numbers. We live in a big complicated world and to make sense of that world we're going to have to use numbers. We need numbers. We can't throw them out. Okay? But neither can we simply say, oh, it's a number. It must be true. Okay? What you need to do is give some thought to where your numbers come from. And what I'm really trying to emphasize is that numbers all have a biography. They have a story. Someone created them. Somebody had some reason to count something, and they made choices about what they were going to count and how they were going to count it and how they were going to add it all up after the counting got done. And, you know, if you want to understand numbers, you, and you need to think about that. I have had the experience over the years of realizing that periodically I'll read a newspaper story and I'll say, good grief, I had no idea things were that bad, okay? 
And I've also learned that if I look into it, they aren't, okay? And that's, when you have that reaction, instead of, you know, thinking that maybe suicide is in order or something like that, take a look at the number and try and figure out how they got it, as that's, that's, that's how you become an educated person. Thanks. Thank you.